Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for being with us this evening. We beseech you and ask that you be with us, that you would come in our presence and that you would lead and guide this class this evening, that you would be with Steve and that you'd speak through him, Father, and that his words would be your words. And may you also speak to our hearts tonight as we listen. May we all learn something that we can do to be a better friend for you. Father, that is our desire is to be um, to, to learn how to be a friend like Jesus was and to love others as you love. Father, we know we must be filled with your love to be able to love others. So we ask for that infilling of your spirit and your character inside of us. And Lord, we also want to lift up anyone who is ill right now that is struggling with COVID or any other sickness. We pray that you would be with those people and that you would help them, that you would help their bodies to fight the, the, the virus. And Father, help us also to be wise as we uh, go about our business each day, that we might be careful, not just be a spreader. And thank you, Father, for loving us and for being with us this evening. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, honey, since uh, no one is really prepared to give their testimony, let me see if anybody else has jumped on. No, I don't see that couple that was going to share this evening. So go ahead and start sharing your, your class, then I'll turn it over to you. Okay, can, can I be heard? Yes, I hear you. Okay, and you can see my screen? Yes, we can see it. Okay. This is entitled Making Friends for Jesus, Following His Method. Wanted to start with sharing a few um, studies that have been done that are related to this topic of making friends for Jesus. The first is uh, the Flavel Yakely study, and I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but in this study, there were three groups of 240 people. And the study uh, found there to be non-responders, church dropouts, and active members. And in each of these three groups, what they found is uh, factors that had really high correlation coefficients, or in other words, something that uh, correlated very highly with uh, the group that they were in. And in the non-responder group, 84% of the people that were non-responders were approached by an information transmission method of, of evangelism. Now, information transmission is kind of the result of somebody thinking that the truth that they're sharing is so powerful that their entire focus is on sharing that truth. Uh, the second group is the people who actually joined a church, but then later on dropped out. Steve, we can't hear you. I muted you. I'm sorry, but I had to mute everyone. Okay. Where do I need to back up to? About a minute ago. Okay. The non-responders? Sure. Okay. 84% uh, of the people that just didn't respond to an evangelistic outreach uh, were found to be, to have been approached by an evangelistic method that we'll call information transmission. This is uh, the result of somebody thinking that 
the truth that they're sharing is so powerful <clears throat> that they they make the assumption that if somebody just understands the truth, they'll naturally follow it. But as you can see in the study, 84% of the people that were approached with that method, they didn't respond to it. The second group were people that had actually joined a church as a result of an evangelistic approach, but later on dropped out. And what they found is that 71% of that group had been approached through an evangelistic method that we'll call manipulative monologue. Well, what's implied in the word monologue is that it's kind of a mostly a one-way uh, communication, but also notice the, the manipulative part. This would be um, an evangelistic approach that would be marked by high level of uh, pressure or the application of guilt, um, so on and so forth. Anything that would be, uh, that could be labeled as manipulative. The third group were the people who had responded to an evangelistic effort and had remained as active members. And 94% of these people were approached by creative dialogue. So this study showed very, uh, very powerfully that the approach that's used is pretty important uh, in terms of efficient or effective uh, evangelism. The second study I wanted to share with you is that from uh, Dr. Gottfried Oosterwald. And in this study, there were 4,000 North American church converts. 57% uh, of all of the converts coming to church came through, uh, through an evangelistic meeting, were invited to the meetings by a relative or friend. So over half of the people had had a personal invitation. So this shows how important it is to, uh, for there to be a friendship involved in helping somebody through the, uh, the process of receiving new information and making a decision uh, uh, in harmony with that information. The third study is Dr. Wynn Arn. He compared 50 active church members with 50 who had dropped out. He looked at the number of friends that each had within six months of church membership. The conclusion was the vast majority of dropouts had few friends and none of those with fewer than three friends remained in the church, but all of those with seven or more friends remained in the church. So this shows how important it is uh, for there to be some kind of discipleship program, whether active or, or not, at least that there's a friendly enough church that, that they embrace new people into their social groups and befriend them. Um, because without that, the vast majority of people don't remain uh, in the church. So the conclusion of these studies are, they make it crystal clear the key role of friendship and caring in winning people for a lasting relationship with Christ. And friendship helps people stay connected to the church family. So that leads us to a question. How do you win people through friendship? How do we make friends for Jesus? Well, the first thing that, that uh, we'll think about here and talk about a bit is to agree with people whenever we can. For instance, if you're in a conversation with somebody that you befriended and they happen to talk about, well, maybe the rapture will happen soon. Is that a good time to launch into a study about the second coming to prove them wrong about their viewpoint about the rapture? Of course not. 
Uh, we want to agree with people as much as we can. And there's nothing inherent unbiblically, unbiblical about the, the idea of a rapture. It's just that we don't agree that it's secret. So you can use their terminology and agree with them. Say, yeah, I'm really looking forward to Jesus coming soon uh, or something of that nature. Or let's say a person says, I'm so thankful that mom is in heaven now. Uh, that's, that's not uh, an opportunity for you to give them uh, proof texts about the state of the dead. Uh, that's not how we agree with people. So the takeaway here is don't win debates, win friends. If in our conversation or in our response to somebody's statement, we put them on the defensive, that's not going to win their friendship, right? From the book Evangelism, page 141, agree with people on every point where you can consistently do so. Let them see you love their souls and want to be in harmony with them as far as possible. So we find it's very important to agree with people whenever we can. But the second point is give approval whenever you can. And in this uh, respect, we can follow Jesus' method. In Mark 14, 9, it says, what she has done will be told in memory of her. That was Jesus giving approval to Mary Magdalene. Or Matthew 15, 28, uh, oh woman, great is your faith. A way, another way we can do that is you ask such good questions. But we have to be careful not to be insincere because insincerity is can be spotted from a mile away. Uh, from the book Evangelism, page 437, your success will not depend so much upon your knowledge and accomplishments as upon your ability to find your way to the heart. So we want to make sure that we become friends with that person in order to be an influencer. And the third point is accept people where they are. Uh, Jesus did that when he, uh, when he rose up and asked the woman, where are your accusers? And she said, <laughs> they're gone. Uh, he accepted the woman where she was. Uh, the thief on the cross, Jesus accepted this person where he was. The woman who touched the hem of his garment would be another example. Or the best example is your own experience. If you think about how Jesus drew your heart, he began with where you were. He didn't, uh, he knew that you wouldn't stay there once you had a relationship with him, but that's where your relationship with him started. Amen. One of the really important principles for us to understand is that we can accept people even if we don't approve of what they're doing. If we see that Jesus needs to make some changes in their lifestyle, for example, we can still accept them and become friends with them so that we have an opportunity to witness to them. And this acceptance, it's not the same thing as our approval. Ask yourself, will my behavior win their hearts in love so they will more likely accept Christ? If Jesus accepts us where we are, can't we accept anyone that he died for in the same way he accepted us? So let's just review the three A's of making friends for Christ. Agree, approve, and accept. And here's a little assignment. Um, I won't take time to go through these because you'll see them in the uh, PDF that Cindy sends to you. Now, last week we touched on uh, how important it was, uh, what we said, when we said it, and how we said it. And uh, so I thought that I would leave it out of this, but then I thought, well, you know, sometimes it's good for us to hear something more than once. 
So let's just reconsider this idea that it's important what we say, how we say it, and when we say it. And then also, what do babies need to eat? They need to eat milk, right? So that's related to the what we say. We don't want to give somebody that is just a, an infant in their Christian experience uh, a heavy load of doctrinal analysis or something like that, uh, something that's more the meat of the gospel. We don't want to wait until they have grown into that. Does that make sense? Isaiah 50 verse 4 says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning, he wakeneth mine ear to hear as the learned. Now, related to this, as we discussed at the last uh, meeting, uh, there's three common mistakes we can make. We can speak the right word, even in the right way, but at the wrong time, or the right word in the wrong way at the right time, or the wrong word in the right way at the right time. And so it's important that we get it right in terms of what we say, how we say it, and when we say it. And leaning back on what we just covered in the previous set of slides, if we have become close friends with people, that's going to help in this process because we're going to uh, know better what their sensitivities are, how they relate to things, what they already know, and so on and so forth if we become friends. Now, in terms of conversational evangelism, let's, uh, let's kind of look at this from, a, from two different models. The first model aims at taking a casual conversation and moving it gently and logically toward a single spiritual point. And in the process, we establish a relationship, we discover the person's interests, and we, at some point, we uh, hopefully we have an opportunity to share our personal testimony. Uh, we establish a common bond by showing concern for the other person. We look at the person as a human being, not as a witnessing project. And then we discover the other person's interests. We can discover their interests by asking questions, by sharing our own interests. Uh, and in the process, we listen for spiritual overtones. We listen for the cry of the heart for God. And we listen for something related to a biblical principle that we can use at some point. And then if we find an opportunity and we feel that the Holy Spirit is nudging is us in that direction, we can ask if we can share our testimony. Now, in terms of the cries of the heart, these are some frequently uh, found cries of the heart to know God, to feel my faith, to find a reason in suffering, and to find freedom from guilt, and to escape pangs of a lonely heart, and to know the cry of God for his people. Uh, what we want to do is start where people are. Start with the things that they talk about and gradually move from there toward spiritual things. If they show resistance, then we don't go further. We back up. Uh, and we move the conversation along as far as their interest allows and end by sharing a testimony. The second model is, uh, we could call it the onion approach, where you start your conversation with uh, just general interest items. And then you move more into a specific interest. And then hopefully you have an opportunity to move from a specific interest into more of a philosophical interest, hoping that that will lead to the opportunity to discuss their spiritual interest. Now, what do I mean by a general interest? Well, generally, when we start out conversations with people, we, we talk about general things. We don't immediately launch into some uh, very intimate detail of our life or something like that or their life. Uh, we might talk about the weather or, you know, what's happening in, in, uh, in the world today or something like that. 
but a more specific interest might be more, you know, questions about their family or, or your family uh, or sharing something about your family uh, or maybe a hobby or something like that. A philosophical interest might be more along the lines of, well, how do you see uh, things that are happening today? Do you, do you see, um, what's your perspective on all of this? How, what's your analysis? Um, uh, where do you get your sources of information from? And along the lines of that kind of uh, discussion, you often will find an opportunity or an opening to uh, move the conversation to a spiritual interest. But you must earn the right to talk about spiritual things. The person must uh, trust you and you must have established a rapport with the person before they're generally gonna be willing to discuss spiritual matters with you. There's a little acronym you can use that can help you to remember um, kind of how to move a conversation along. The acronym is FORT. The F stands for family. If you start out in a discussion with somebody that you're wanting to develop a friendship with, uh, talk about their family, talk about your family. The O is occupation. People, especially men, like, love to talk about what they do, um, what their job is. Um, the R stands for religion. You might ask, uh, you know, did you grow up in a religious home? Uh, are your parents churchgoers? Um, you know, things like that. And then the T is you're looking for an opportunity to share your testimony with them. And we highly advise that you ask permission to share your testimony. Uh, at the point of transition to sharing your, your faith, ask permission to share. May I share with you is, is actually a very powerful technique because if you've asked permission and they've given it, they're going to politely listen to you. May I share with you how I found freedom from guilt? If you found in your discussion with them and your philosophical discussion, for example, that maybe they're dealing with problems with guilt, then that might be a good thing to ask. May I share with you how I found freedom from guilt? On the other hand, if in your discussion with them, you found that they're dealing with, uh, you know, they're dealing with grief, then you might say, may I share with you how I've been able to get through grief? And then if they say yes, then you go into your testimony about your experience with grief. Uh, or may I share what I found in a relationship with Christ? if they've been discussing with you relationship problems. May I share with you how I find personal peace and answers to the stress in my life. Perhaps they've shared with you that they're all stressed out. And uh, so this might be how you would ask if you can share your testimony. Ask for the Holy Spirit to guide you into a better understanding of conversational evangelism by studying the following texts. Ephesians 4.29, uh, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Or Colossians 4, 5, and 6, which says, walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer each one. And then 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And then John 5, 1 through 9, I won't go through that one. You can look that one up later. So that's, uh, that's conversational evangelism. Anybody Nick, have any I questions have, so far? Yeah, Mickey um, has a question. You want to ask him, Mickey? I just posted it in the chat there. Uh, how would you handle someone who, who is a Christian, professes Christianity, but anytime anything that is um, has a spiritual tone uh, to it, uh, they become very, very uh, aggressive. How would you handle that kind of person? 
I would avoid uh, trying to get into any heavy spiritual topics with them and limit it maybe just to sharing testimonies if they're open to that. But if that itself makes them aggressive, then I wouldn't even go that far. I would just, you know, continue to have a friendship with them. Uh, don't go any farther than having those philosophical type discussions and just keep praying that God will provide an open, uh, provide an opening at a later date with that person. That, that would be my suggestion. Cindy, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think you covered it pretty well. If someone is not open and they're very hostile, the best thing is just totally back away from any kind of spiritual conversation. What I've found, especially like with family members that have had this kind of a reaction in the past to me is to really just not say anything and let your light shine through your lifestyle and through your love for them. And then they'll come to you um, and pray for them. Honestly, that is the best thing to do with someone in that stage of their relationship with, with God. And um, before you go on, Steve, Inez has a question. Okay. Go ahead and unblock your, your or I mean, unmute yourself, Inez. Okay. Um, so my question is, you were saying, um, agree whenever we can, wherever possible. Um, so how does one respond in making friends with someone who... For instance, you gave the example, the state of the dead. You don't really want to go into, well, no, that's not the case. That's not how it works. You know, your mom's not in heaven. Then how do you handle that? Do you just kind of bypass that or like, what do you do? Uh, you do you do bypass it. You mm -hmm. find some statement that you can make that, that allows you to be in, in agreement with the person. Mm -hmm. And hopefully you'll have an opportunity to get them engaged in a spiritual discussion, and maybe that would lead to a Bible study. And even if you got them into a Bible study, you wouldn't immediately go to state of the dead. You okay. need to build a foundation with that person and develop a friendship with them uh, before you would get to something that you would consider to be a testing truth. Okay. At least that's the approach I would suggest. I would also, um, Inez, you know, when they, when you got to the point where you were, were going to study that with the person that has believes this, that they're in heaven and it's something that is very near and dear to their heart, that they think that, let's say they think their mother's looking over them or, or their dead loved one is, you know, in heaven, really pray before you reveal a testing truth like that to someone, because you want to be sure that they're ready to receive that information. Will we be going over that a little bit later, Steve? Uh, testing truths? Yes. Uh, not tonight. We won't, we won't get to that tonight. Okay. Okay. Thank uh, you. But I'm going a little, uh, we may have time uh, after the testimonies that we could cover that a little bit. Uh, I hadn't planned on it, but I mean, we could, if that, if you feel like that's, um, well, we can talk, we'll see how the time goes, but yeah, we can talk yeah. about that, especially if you're dealing with something at, at right, you know, currently at the moment and you don't want to wait to, to talk about some of those things. We certainly can do that at the end. We also have um, Melissa who has raised her hand. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Melissa. And, and yeah, share. my question, uh, well, it's pertaining to what uh, Inez had uh, stated uh, before. Um, what and it's uh, pertaining to the state of the dead. So, what if you had that same situation that you believe, you know, that you know your loved ones was looking down, and uh, it has been you do Bible studies that you it been revealed to you. Um, should I share that testimony with them or no? I would say that's not a good thing to share in a testimony. Okay. Uh, your, your testimony is what Jesus has done in your life. Mm -hmm. And certainly learning new truths can be part of your testimony, but that's not the thing that you want to share early in a relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why the, the, we, we put the word testing to truths is uh that these are often things that people really, really, really struggle with. 
And that's why we call them testing truths. So there might be something like uh, the sanctuary message or the Sabbath. Uh, more and more, the second coming itself is a testing truth. State of the dead can be a testing truth. Uh, hellfire uh, can be a testing truth for some people. So those kind of subjects are best left until uh, you have had an opportunity to engage this person in a Bible study and, and you've, you've built in, in the early part of a Bible study, what we like to do is build a foundation for these testing truths, but, you, but the, the person is kind of unaware that you're doing that. And so you're studying things that, they're in, that they can agree with. Uh, you, they might be learning a lot of new things along the way, but you're not bumping up against something that's a, uh, a cherished belief that they have until you are deep into a friendship with them. That friendship will carry them through that, that testing truth a lot better than if you share it too early with them. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you so much. And Steve, uh, <clears throat> Shauna, did you have any other question? One, one small question. Um, what is your opinion on persons who knock on your door? Because, you know, oftentimes we have, you know, the Mormons or the, mm -hmm. the, the Jehovah's Witness knock on, on our door. Are those, are those candidates for, for Bible study? What, what is your opinion on that? Should we invite them in? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. Um, we, uh, we thought we had developed a pretty cool strategy for sharing with, uh, with Mormon missionaries. And, um, um, you know, we, we went through the process of sharing with them how God always has a, a prophet that will talk about something that's going to come in the future. But then when that event happens, they would have a present truth prophet that would share that. And so we would go through a bunch of examples showing that pattern throughout. And then we would take them to uh, the 2300 day prophecy and show them that, you know, it pointed to 1844 and say, okay, 1844 is clearly a message that God wants us to know about. And so the prophet that told us about it was Daniel, but wouldn't it make sense given all these other examples that there would be a present truth prophet and then we would pose a question to them well there's only two groups that i'm aware of that claim to have a prophet in 1844 and then i would say would you be interested in studying that topic with me and we have engaged some Mormon young people into Bible studies that using that that method, but I can't say that there's been much fruit from it. And uh, I guess if you ask a series of questions of that person, and you find that they're more interested in convincing you that they're right, they're not a person that's really looking for new truth. And one of the principles that we believe really strongly in is that it's very important that you find people that are open and that you engage in Bible studies and in friendships with people that are open to learning something. And uh, well, not that you withhold your friendship if they're not open, but I'm just saying in terms of moving into a more spiritual dimension of the friendship, you, you look for a, uh, an opening. If somebody's argumentative or they're just trying to convert you to their, uh, to their uh, church, that's probably not the best candidate for you to target as uh, a potential Bible study. Can that's I share my, that's something? That's my opinion. Can I share something to that, Steve? Sure. 
I have, I have, you know, I was raised Mormon and I've, um, whenever Mormon missionaries come to my home, I welcome them in because I love talking to Mormons. Um, they're lovely people. They're kind and good and loving people, but they're not really open. They think they're, they have the truth and, and they need to save you. And um, Jehovah's Witnesses are similar in the same regard. They're usually not very open. So a lot of times it, it, it's not fruitful, but you can just plant some, sleep, some seeds um, or share if they'll take it. Most time they won't take anything you have, but you could, I gave a great controversy to some Mormon missionaries at one time, which that's another long story, but it, 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 it convinced the, the Mormon missionary about the Sabbath. So you just never know. So just pray. Um, if you don't have time to talk, don't, I wouldn't invite them in if you do and you wanna chat with them. They're very kind and they're very, very um, open to talk to you about many things. But just remember, they're usually there to convince you that they're right. And it can be just a time waster, but, but you never know, you know, you never know. And Pierre had a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Pierre. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I, you, I, Steve, you keep using this term when you mention uh, a certain type of truth. What, what types of truths would you, in your experience, say that, you know, I'm guessing that term that you keep using, and it, it just left me as I've been waiting to, to mention it, uh, the term That's left me. Testing truth? Yes, testing truth. Would that be like, are you saying like a controversial subject? Well, let's say you're, you're studying with somebody that's uh, a Baptist. And uh, if you're studying with a Baptist, uh, entering into a study about the millennium and about... Uh, the fact that hellfire isn't eternal, uh, that for that person could be a testing truth. It's a test for them because it's uh, something that disagrees with something that they uh, hold as, a, as an important belief system uh, in, their, in their religious experience. And so it's a testing truth in, in that sense. Um, let's uh, take another example. Maybe you're studying with a, a Catholic person and you are studying Daniel 7. And so you're revealing the Antichrist um, and you're getting into territory like the second angel's message and the third angel's message. Those ki that kind of information can easily be a testing truth to a Catholic person. Or let's say you're talking to somebody that uh, frequently talks about the secret rapture and how dear that belief is to their heart. Then when you get to that subject and you study that with that person, that could be a testing truth to that person. Does that explain it better to you? Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. Okay. And Michelle has a question too tonight. Good evening, everyone. It's um, not really a question. It was really just an, a quick experience and comment also about the friendly folks who come and knock at your doors. I had a Jehovah's Witness friend um, and she came for probably about a year and I would invite her in and we would study many different things, but something that you brought up, Steve, here that I found myself doing a lot was um, just finding things to agree on. And it was never, I think that she had the same spirit that I had though, even being, you know, quote unquote, a Jehovah's Witness that there was a true sense of friendship. We became friends and sharing um, for over a year. Um, and again, again, of course, many times they are trying to convince you but we would just chat. I just never went there. And um, we found many things to agree on um, until she was just reassigned to a different place. And that could be too, I think something within their 
their denomination or religion is. Once you've been with someone for so long and they're not responsive, you kind of carry on. But it was never anything ugly. She let me know when she was reassigned, and we were very good friends for over that time frame. Yeah, that's the idea of friendship evangelism. You, you, uh, you develop a friendship with somebody, and you just look for opportunities to get into a spiritual conversation. Sometimes that never happens. Um, sometimes you're, you may have an opportunity to sow a few seeds, but somebody else actually is there for the harvest. Um, it's an interesting process. But I suspect that we're going to see this whole process uh, shortened uh, quite a bit here as we move into the into the near future. Uh, any other questions before we go into the next uh, next part of this? So uh, I, I have another question based on what Michelle was talking about and what she just said. So, because so many scriptures was coming to my brain, you know, we're in the world, we're not of it, you know, separate ourselves from, you know, those who don't believe in, in, the gospel, what it truly is, when is enough enough? Like, yes, you're, you're meeting people and the goal is to yes, make friends, but if it's prolonged and there's no fruits coming from that, I mean, granted you're planting seeds and this can happen 10 years from now because of that, um, you know, relationship or those conversations that are being had for that time frame. But is there ever a time when enough is enough when you're like, okay, let's just pack up and move to the next person? <laughs> is there such a thing? <laughs> uh, well, that's a good question, but it, it also kind of calls into question our motives, because uh -huh. if the only reason why we're a friend with somebody is, is simply because they're a, a witnessing opportunity, then, you know, that probably will ultimately be discovered by the person. Mm. So, uh, you know, when we decide that we're going to become friends with somebody, I, in my opinion, that's kind of a permanent decision, an irrevocable tight decision. That person may not, uh, when, you, when you say enough is enough, if you're talking about, well, maybe you don't spend as much time with them, I can agree with that. Uh, but I think that when we develop a friendship with somebody, that needs to be permanent. Yeah, it's not even just a friendship, even if it's a family member, you have your family, their family for life. Yeah. What I'm saying is when you're having these conversations and, you know, years okay, gone by, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, there's no fruit coming from that. Like when yep. do you say, okay, let me just yep. leave this alone and, you know. Yep. That's, the, that's the idea that we're going to come to later on, this okay. concept of, of pressure and release, pressure and release. Okay. Um, you have to know when it's, when it's time to release uh, when it's time to kind of put things into neutral and just coast for a while uh, and look for another opportunity, maybe down the road sometime. Um, yeah, we have to be uh, students of human behavior so that we learn to recognize those, those, uh, uh, those situations. And uh, we'll, we'll get more into that later about how to know when somebody's open and how to know when people are even... Uh, uh, when they're under conviction, uh, how do you know that? Um, because being able to recognize those things that alters, uh, uh, how we deal with the person, what we say to them, um, whether we're trying to help them to come to a decision or not, whether, you know, there's different junctures in the road that, uh, that being a reader of these things helps us quite a bit. All right, are we ready to launch into this next? Uh, I think Melissa has a, a question. Okay. It, it's, it's real quick, Steve. I'm sorry, but this is just a, another testimony uh, to Inez's uh, point. So uh, about 18 years ago, Inez, a guy was witnessing to me. Uh, he was my cashier. I was his supervisor in Louisiana. And... Long story short, I went to an event, my husband and I went to an event that the bachelor was throwing in Tennessee. 
and I saw him there. So he was an Adventist witnessing to me, and he was just in praise about the fact that I became an Adventist. And I heard it, it was just his prayer, and he was just so excited uh, to see me. So uh, I say all that to say is, uh, yeah, don't give up. You know, you will see someone from 20 years from now, you know, that you had witnessed to, and you might be at the same event. Got it. That's a, that's a great, great story. Thanks for sharing that. <clears throat> All right, if there's no other questions, I'll, let's uh, go into this next section here. It's entitled Building Bridges. Uh, according to a survey by Bell and Associates, uh, there's several questions that are very common that people have that they may not be willing to ask, but these are questions that they're ask, asking themselves. How can I cope with loneliness? How can I manage stress? How can I find inner peace? Is the world falling apart? Now, this Bell and Associates survey was actually from uh, a good 20 years ago or more. So, uh, yeah, probably a little more, a little over 20 years ago, this survey. But can you imagine uh, how much more important these same questions are today? People are really stressed out. They really don't have peace. There's a lot of people that are lonely and a lot of people thinking, is the world falling apart? So these questions have only become more and more prominent as we approach uh, the end of time. And why is there so much suffering? Um, that's a question on a lot of people's mind as well. So people have these questions and the Holy Spirit is going to make an appointment with a person that has a question uh, to be able to interact with a person that has the answers. For example, the Ethiopian eunuch, he had questions. He was reading the scripture and, and uh, he wanted to understand it better. And the Holy Spirit brought Philip to him uh, to give some answers. There are people all around us who sense that we're living on the verge of a stupendous crisis. There are many who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. All over the world, men and women are looking wistfully to heaven. Many are on the verge of the kingdom, waiting only to be gathered in. It never ceases to amaze me how often people will say things like, I have never heard these things before. They're so impressed with Bible prophecy as, as an example, or a clear, uh, um, a clear um, outline of what is the gospel, um, or how one truth fits into another truth. People are just, I don't know, I guess they're just not being fed. Um, and so when you are uh, giving them a Bible study and they're finding spiritual food, they just, they just eat it up. It just, it just amazes me. There are many who are reading the scriptures who cannot understand their true import. And uh, God has given each of you uh, an understanding of scriptures and apparently a desire to share that with others or you wouldn't be on this, uh, on this Zoom thing. And, uh, and I think this is an appointment for all of us that God has arranged because he has people he wants us to share with. So building bridges, how do we do it? Well, these, this is a list of things uh, I put together before this COVID situation. Um, but nevertheless, let's just go through it because hopefully this won't last forever. 
If it does, then we're going to have to modify some of these things. But one thing we can do is follow media interests. Uh, all of the uh, medias, uh, whether it be Amazing Facts, whether it be It Is Written, Faith for Today, Voice of Prophecy, um, so far as I know, all of them will share their media contacts. Uh, you could contact them and, and give your zip code and uh, they'll tell you people that have, you know, called in or written or responded to something or, or requested some materials through the internet or whatever. Um, so that's one possibility. What uh, Cindy and I used to really enjoy doing was do a religious survey. We would go door to door with our daughter and do a religious survey. And we'd spend three or four hours doing that and we'd pick up a Bible study. It was pretty amazing how, how predictable it was. If you put the time in, you'd always pick up a Bible study. Um, we would do this door to door. Another uh, possibility is do mailings. Uh, uh, maybe a letter offering Bible studies or a telephone survey. Um, of course, friendship evangelism, uh, hosting meetings in your home. Um, uh, Cindy has found success with using the Nextdoor app uh, and telling people about cooking schools, things like that. And, and, and uh, she's held cooking schools here at the, in her house and made a lot of friends that way. Uh, seminars. Um, Lonnie's husband uses this as a as a technique to uh, develop uh, new friendships by holding a seminar. Uh, if you are going to use the door to door approach, uh, people have these questions. Who are you? What do you want? How long are you going to interrupt them? So what you want to do is in the very first sentence that comes out of your mouth, you want to answer all three of those questions. A media survey might be, are you a regular viewer, listener? Uh, which programs appeal to you most? Have you received uh, the materials you requested? Have you taken one of our Bible courses? Would you be interested in our new series of Bible guides uh, or our free video Bible guides or interested in someone helping you with your Bible study? You could do a religious survey. Uh, do you believe Jesus will return soon? Our final events of this earth beginning to take place? Are churches more or less spiritual than they were 20 years ago? What church did your parents attend? Do you attend the same church? Are you familiar with the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation? And when we would do the survey, the, after that last question, we would say, well, you know, if, if they'd say, no, I'm not really familiar with it, or even if they would say they were familiar, we'd say, well, would you be interested in studying Daniel and Revelation with someone. And if they said yes, we just set up an appointment to come back for a Bible study. It's, it's, you know, there's naturally a lot of people that have no interest in this stuff, but you'd be amazed at how many people there are that have an interest and how many people you'll find that says, you know, I've been praying for two weeks that God would send somebody to my door. Um, uh, in a few minutes, I, uh, Cindy can share a testimony about that with you. Uh, demonstrate caring in tangible ways. This is how we might witness uh, to friends and relatives. Cultivate interest through literature. Uh, look for opportunities. Share biblical answers. God has someone for you to win. Uh, I won't go through these assignments. All right, that that finishes it up. So Cindy, uh, can we switch over to the testimonies now? Sure. Um, Jan and Myron, I see you're on tonight. Did you guys prepare your two minute testimonies? Were you prepared to share it this evening? All right, got a yes. thumbs up. Okay. So it looks to me like Jan is ready. You want me to go ahead? Absolutely. Let me get my timer ready. We'll time to see how yeah. long it took you. All right. Okay. Are you ready? All right. Okay. You may begin. What is, 
purpose of life. As a young adult, I was searching for meaning. I was lost in worldly pursuits, my career, my independence, my desire to succeed and make a name for myself. After college, my dream was to live and work in a small coastal town in California. I accepted a position in management at a Santa Cruz hospital. After a year of employment, I was called into my supervisor's office. In effect, Tom said I was fired or I could resign. I chose resignation and looked for ways to combat the smudge on my professional career. My parents back east were divorcing, so there was nowhere to go. I begrudgingly applied for unemployment and spiraled into a deep depression. A friend invited me to some Bible prophecy lectures at a movie theater in town. As I sat night by night listening to the love of Jesus, how he died for me and had a plan for my life, I was mesmerized. As God spoke to my heart in that movie theater, I accepted him as my Lord and my Savior. He did a miracle in my life. He gave me hope. He delivered me from suicidal depression and gave me purpose and meaning. Now I know he gave me the dream of California and then saved me there by introducing himself to me in that dark movie theater. He came into my life and transformed me. I now have the joy of a Christian husband and we labor for Jesus wherever he leads, at church, in the marketplace, in our neighborhood. His joy in service and peace in trial is everything to me. There is an amazing relationship with the creator of the universe, the sustainer of all life, and the soon coming king awaiting you. Would you like to know more about him? Wow. Jan, that was powerful. That was great. That was exactly really one, one minute, 59 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was that was a very good very good testimony very well written um you went through the what was what life was like before i met jesus how i met jesus and how it's been transformed since so you got those three steps in there you had an introduction you had a conclusion uh and you even had an appeal um yeah that uh um that's very good. I can't even think of a way that you could improve that. That was a powerful testimony. And what's beautiful about that is you could easily supplement that. If you find you have more time than two minutes, you, that could easily be extended by adding a few details in any one of those sections. You can, I'm sure, extend that to hours, <laughs> an hours long yeah. testimony or a 15 minute testimony or 10 minute testimony or a five minute testimony. So now that you've you, you know, you know how to do a two minute testimony and you've got that practiced out, you'll find that, uh, that God's going to make appointments for you to share that testimony with other people. I'm sure he already has in the past, but um, hopefully this two minute idea has been a learning experience for you. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I had to sit down today and pray and it was like, okay, we're under the gun, got to get it done, you know, and God came through. Praise his name. Well, thank you for sharing that. Jan, it was amazing. I really appreciated your, just everything that you said. And I can imagine that anyone that would hear that would want to know more. That's wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you. And, and especially the, the depression part too, because so mm -hmm. many people are dealing with depression. It's just like this overwhelming problem in our culture today. Yes, it's amazing at a theater as well. I mean, God will reach us anywhere, right? doesn't matter where we are. He can reach us in yeah. any situation. Exactly. I was raised Catholic and I had pretty much given up on organized religion. So the movie theater was just the avenue that the Lord was able to get through to me. And I just, it's amazing. He's so but we good. need good Christian programming for sure, because there's a lot of people in the world that never pick up a Bible, never pick up a track, never even be interested. And so praise God. Amen. Okay, Myron, are you ready? 
I don't know. You, you, you can, we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, you, I'm sure it'll be great. It's your, your, what Jesus did for you. No one can argue with that, right? <laughs> okay. Go, go right ahead. Okay. I was raised as a Christian and accepted Christ as my savior when I was 12 years old. I can't imagine living without Christ in my life. This does not mean that I'm perfect. There has been plenty of growth in different areas of my life, but it is wonderful having a loving Savior who answers prayer and gives power to overcome. There is a great peace of mind that comes when you are on the side of Christ in the battle against evil within and without, and knowing that the reward of eternal life will be given when life's struggles are over. The same power available to me is available to you if you will give Jesus a chance to work in your life. May I share more with you. Awesome. That's awesome. That's awesome. That, that was, was 40 th seconds. 30 second testimony. That's great. That is perfect. <laughs> well, wow. for, for I, learned, I learned some things from that. Let me tell you about being really concise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really. I, I will say one thing that you, you were just saying about um, is the world falling apart? That question. We just started giving Bible studies to a, some friends of ours month, this past Monday, since the, the last time we met. And what I had done is I had simply just emailed them and said, you know, I never talked to you about spiritual things when we were working together. And I said, I, would you like me to do that? And they were like, yeah, we were just talking about that. The world's in a terrible, you know, whatever. And I said, well, I'd like to share some things. And so... Yeah, we're getting ready to have our second meeting tomorrow. So, praise the Lord. It's pretty easy yeah. nowadays with that question about yeah. the condition of the world. Right. That's just, that's just, you should just leap on that. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah, there's real opportunities. Right after 9 11, actually, the week after 9 11, Cindy and I went door to door just in our neighborhood and found 13 people interested in studying with us. Mm -hmm. Now, not all of them wound up following through, but we wound up out of, out of the people that kind of continued, we wound up having a weekly Bible study in our house that consisted of about six people. And mm -hmm. our recollection is about four of those people uh, went all the way to baptism. Praise the Lord. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that was just, it, we just went around our neighborhood and introduced ourselves and asked if they felt like the events that were happening in the world were, do you, do you think that they might've been prophesied in, in the Bible? And so many people were like, yeah, I bet they are. And, you know, and so that's what our opening conversation was. <laughs> but right after 9-11, I mean, everybody had a high, heightened sense of um, wanting to know what on earth is going on. Mm -hmm. So. And I think after well, COVID, we're going to have to say yeah, that. we're going door to door with our neighbors, taking them a little Christmas package uh, with a, a uh, Good idea. kingdoms in time, um, a little bit of cranberry bread I made, and um, and asking them, letting them know that we believe time is short, Jesus is coming. If they have any interest in that, to let us know. But we're making friends all over the place. And we just met some people that know some people that we know from South Georgia that are admins and they may come to church with us and oh. other neighbors already come to church. So you're right. Get out there. You know, the Lord says go and he will bless us. That's right. Amazing. Now, before we go into the next section, Steve has prepared for us. Is, can I get three more volunteers for next week? Cindy, I'm done. Oh, you're finished for tonight? I think I finished all four sections i thought we only did two sections no no wow that was pretty speedy okay yeah. I, thought, <laughs> I thought i wouldn't be able to finish it all but we got through it all awesome. so we have time we can talk about that testing truth idea or you know whatever so related to some of those questions okay before we go to that can i get three volunteers for testimonies next week I'll share next week. Jean, okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, Jean. Two more. Anyone else? 
I know this is next week will be the Sunday after Christmas. So think about your family plans and that we are mm -hmm. still planning on having this. So maybe not a lot of you will be able to join us, but we'll record and send out the link, but we don't want to lose momentum. So we plan on, on having it next Sunday night. So any other, anybody else willing to share their testimony next week? I know it's really, you know, you might be a little shy if you want to write it out and, you know, Steve or I could read it. We could do it that way as well. Don't you think Steve, or do you think it's a good exercise just to share it out loud? I think the latter. Yeah, I know we do need to come out of our, our shyness, but you know, a lot of times in situations where you're where you're given the opportunity to share a lot of times it isn't someone you know it is harder to do it actually before a group like this than it is the reality of it uh, so if you can share your testimony here you'll definitely be able to share it later cindy i don't want to commit to next week i'm looking at the third okay mick i'll put it out for then All right. Well, maybe it's just not conducive since it's the Sunday after Christmas, but um, text me, you guys. I put my, at the very top of the chat, I put my phone number and, and email. Email me or, or text me if you think you can next week. But um, anyway, I'll let Steve share about testing truths then. And Jean will look forward to your testimony next Sunday. Okay. Okay, let's... Uh... Let's talk about uh, Daniel 1. Uh, if I were to start a Bible study with somebody that I didn't know very well, and I was going to go through Daniel in order, I do Daniel 1, what would be the topic of Daniel 1? What would be my teaching point of Daniel 1? Diet. Honey, honey, you may know this because you did that with me when I was when I first came into the truth. Pierre. Jan has her hand up. Jan, you want to share? Go ahead. Um, to me, Daniel one's all about um, uh, health, diet, and being true to what we know. I, I heard somebody else also say that. Any other thoughts? You know, I like to sell people on the fact that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to be uh, 10 times better than you are now? You know, like just have an amazing improvement in, in all aspects of your life, you know, and that's kind of what I see in Daniel chapter one how you can be 10 times better by simply being obedient to God. Faithfulness. That's, that's, that's interesting, Pierre. I like that. All right, let me, uh, let me use Daniel 1 in our discussion as a, as a means of further explaining this idea about testing truth. Is diet a testing truth yes all right well if it's a testing truth would i want that then to be the subject of my very first bible study no 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 no, no. I think no it there's no absolutely no question we can teach diet mm -hmm. and the importance of diet out of daniel one but if that's our very first bible study we wouldn't want that to be the focus of the bible study so what else could be the focus of the Bible study? Well, the king took everything away from these young kids. These are teenage boys. Their parents probably had been killed in front of them. They've been forced to march for 1,400 miles, probably deprived of, of, of eating a normal diet or drinking the normal amount of water. They're walking through the desert for 1,400 miles. They were... Uh, they became eunuchs. So at some point they had a surgical procedure done on them. They lost 
part of their body. They, uh, they'd been taken away from their culture. Everything that they knew was gone. It looked like God had abandoned them. And so they get into Babylon and they, they, they march through that gate and see this fabulous city. And then they discover that the king has plans for them, uh, that they were to be trained at the Babylon University and they were to eat off the king's table and they were given these Babylonian names and, and everything. What is it that the king is trying to do? He's trying to reprogram them, right? Yeah. It's kind of like our military. We take young people, we take everything away from them, teach them that if there's something that they need, it's provided by the, uh, by the government for them. And it's a, it's a means of kind of like breaking them down to bring them into compliance with uh, the, the, military's go the military goals. Well, that's what Nebuchadnezzar was doing with these young people. And in spite of that, in Daniel 1 verse 8, it said that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Well, that word purposed is the same word used, it's translated, uh, gave in other parts of Daniel chapter 1. So what we can say is that Daniel gave his heart to God, and thereby he established a connection with heaven. And that then becomes a building block that you use throughout Daniel about how do we get connected and stay connected and strengthen that connection with heaven. And you, you use that, that lesson from Daniel 1 throughout the rest of Daniel. Because yeah. in Daniel 2, when, they, when the king shares this, uh, when they find out about this dream and this, this edict from the king, what happens? They decide to have a prayer meeting, right? Mm -hmm. And so that then is a, a key that you build on the first key. You establish your connection to heaven by giving your heart, but you stay connected to heaven through communication with God. So you talk about prayer. So prayer can be the subject of your Daniel 2 Bible study, maybe before you get to the prophecy part. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, does that help explain this idea of testing truth? We go all the way through Daniel and we get through several lessons in Revelation before we finally arrive at any kind of a testing truth in the way that typically Cindy and I do Bible studies with people. So you're mm -hmm. with the person for quite a long time before you really uh, run up against something that, that challenges what they believe. Yeah. But during the whole study, you're building a foundation uh, for people to be able to accept those testing truths later on. That's why I love doing this form of Bible study as opposed to a topical Bible study. It's, it's, it's uh, called Keys of the Kingdom. And we have the PowerPoint, if you're interested, and you may have downloaded that from when I offered it. Um, if you came to any of the lead um, conference lead uh, meetings that we've done for the uh, the lead program if you have come to that you may have already downloaded those those powerpoints off my um my dropbox but if you guys are interested in this series it takes you through daniel the only testing truth in daniel is daniel 7 which is the papacy and it doesn't have another testing truth until halfway through Revelation, and you get to the Sabbath. And so um, it, it really builds a relationship with people for a very long time before you get into something that will um, make them. And the reason why Steve and I call it testing truths is because it tests them. It tests their faith as to whether they'll follow God or what they've been taught all their life. So it's a test for them. And, and do I believe God's word or do I believe what my pastor's been telling me all my life or my mother and my father have been telling me? So it's a test. It's just like the Garden of Eden where Eve had to say, do I believe what God has told me or do I believe what the serpent is telling me? And so it's a test. And that's why we use that terminology as a testing truth. 
most other Bible studies that I've used in the past, you wind up getting to testing truths much earlier in the series. And uh, what I particularly like about this is that uh, it's, it comes so late and I find it much more effective. It used to be that I would be so much in prayer when I'd come to the Sabbath or state of the dead or whatever, something that I knew was going to be hard for somebody because often people would drop their Bible study at that point with this study. I seldom have people drop, even if they don't accept it right away, they still continue the study because you've had a chance to develop such a relationship with them before you get to anything like that. And uh, so most people, they're not offended. They, they, you know, they see it as a test. They understand that, but they ought, but they usually continue their study. So if anyone wants to join us, um, we teach the keys to most everyone we study with. I, there's a few people I don't, um, cause I, they're just not quite ready, but if they're, if, if you want to experience what the, these lessons are like, you can join us, um, in a group study, let me know. And I can let you know where I'm at in certain, cause I've got multiple ones going on right now. And I, and it's during different time periods as according to your schedule. But I, I also, my, my goal is to tape these keys to the kingdom and make videos and put them on my website. So that's another thing I want to get done. I just haven't had time to do, but that's another goal of mine to get that done. So I can share those with people and you can listen to it and then listen to the study and then you can take the PowerPoint and share it with someone and just kind of do it that way. Listen, and then you do it and listen, and then you do it. And um, it's, it's really not hard. It's a PowerPoint that just walks you through it. Awesome. <clears throat> so I had, a, I had a question. Maybe this is not a good question. But the question, when you were talking about testing truth, I, I love the terminology. But then when you chose Daniel, Daniel 1, I, I realized that this is a testing point for even some of us as Adventists. So then it begs the question, you know, if you are teaching, giving a Bible study, I guess, on any topic, I just use diet since that's what, you know, some people hinted at with the with um, Daniel one. And suppose that's a testing truth for you yourself, who the, the, the individual who's giving the Bible study, or at some point you just come upon a topic with your, with the person you're studying with that is, you know, a testing truth for you yourself. <laughs> You know, um, you know, can you speak to that a little bit? Cindy, you want to take that one? Well, you mean, are you meaning like you're, you're, you don't feel that like you're following the health laws as good as you could be? Is that what yeah, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since we're using that one as an example, yes. Well, I do a lot of health evangelism and I teach it and I'm not perfect at it. And I tell people I'm honest. I'll say, you know, you guys, I'm up here. I'm teaching you how to do vegan cooking. Does that mean I never have dairy in my diet? No, but I, you know, I try to let them know that in this world, if this is the optimal. This is what's the best. And if we can adhere and change our, 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 our diet to a certain point to the, to change to that ultimate optimal diet, then if we take steps towards that, I always teach that in my classes, how important it is to take steps toward the optimal and, and to pray and ask God to give you the ability to do this. So like, say you're, te you're, you're the testing truth for someone is Sabbath and they have to work on Sabbath. And there, that is a huge test that, to go to their employer. And, and, you know, so you, you have to help them know that you'll be praying with them and share there are some books out there. I have one that's called, um, it's, it's stories about people that had to, that wanted to keep the Sabbath and how God did miracles for them to be able to, once they made their mind up to do it. So you've got to have some stories to share, help people to be able to step out in faith and trust God that he'll take care of them no matter what they, you know, if they want to do it, that God will provide. And I think that's the key is to help them in their, in their, their step being their incremental steps towards following God's testing truth, following God, rather than, you know, 
um, sacrificing uh, truth for because of fear or lack of faith um, and these things. But one thing Steve said that Daniel one would not probably be a good study to start with health, except when you're doing health evangelism. I teach a vegan cooking class and people that come to my home, this is how I get them to study with me. As I say, do you know, after I've got to know them, not the first night, <laughs> you know, not the first night, but after I've built this relationship with them, that I'll say, you know, you guys, we know science is behind this. We know that, you know, all of these things, this is the best way to eat, but do you know that this is the way that God taught us to eat? And, and, and so many people are floored by this. And so then I will do, I will start with um, a series of studies that Don McIntosh made, which is called Health to Him. And I go through da Daniel one through six and every single one is a health um, a segment on health pulled out of Dan the chapters Daniel one through six. And then we get to seven, then we ask them, would you like to continue on in the prophecies? And usually everybody does want to. And so I can share those studies with you too. And you can share that, you can share health in that way. But that's, I only do that with people that already believe that this is the best way to live. And, and you built a re relationship where you can show them in the Bible um, that the vegan, you know, lifestyle plus other factors, not just diet, but so many other factors for good health are all in the Bible. And, um, and they're amazed, they're amazed by it. Any questions on any of that? Or anything Steve shared earlier? Cindy, I just have a comment uh, regarding that. Sure. Can you hear me? Um, yeah. At Emory, I, I facilitate a number of classes. I teach about uh, diabetes, uh, hypertension, uh, smoking cessation, you know, a number of topics. Uh, but one of the things that, um, that I've seen that uh, works really well and helps me connect with people is if I can identify with them. The more I can identify with them, I have a better connection. And they really appreciate authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's, I, I think that applies to being authentic. Uh, we're talking about Bible, talking about salvation. You know, we have all sinned, you know. You know, I fall short too. Uh, and one of the other things I like to do is I, uh, if I do have a problem in whatever area, say I'm talking to someone about decreasing their sodium intake because of hypertension, I will say, hey, I'm going to do this too. I'm going to limit my whatever, whatever that is. And again, that helps with that connection. That's awesome. You know, do it together. Help that person, you know, as they're struggling through. I just got done doing a diabetes undone series and I'm not diabetic. But I wanted to help the, the people in my class. So we, you know, we all decided, okay, for the next, you know, we had 10, eight weeks of classes. We decided that we'd all try to adhere to the, the nutrition side of the diabetes together and to see if we could share how we felt after changing it and amazing results. Actually, so many people went way down on their insulin or got off their insulin and and, um, you know, I'm not diabetic, but I, you know, I, I tried to stay more pure in my diet during that time just to support them. Well, you guys, it's 729. Um, mm -hmm. If there's anything else anyone wants to share or anything anyone else wants to um, ask, please. Raise your raise. If you, does everyone know how to raise the hand in the in the Zoom? Yes. Okay. So if you if you have something you want to ask, Jean. No, no. I was just saying yes. I know how to okay. do. It. <laughs> so if you guys want to, um, I'll turn it back to Steve for closing prayer. You're you're un, You need to unmute yourself. I was going to ask Mick if he would do closing prayer for us. Sure, thank you. Okay, let's pray. Father, it's been so good to spend this uh, 90 minutes with um, these beautiful people. We thank you again for Steve and Cindy as they've been facilitating this course. Uh, Father, um, we pray that you will continue to bless us as we learn, as we share with each other, hearing new things and uh, affirming some things that we know. 
Uh, Lord, we just uh, look forward to seeing the fruits of our labor, uh, but help us to be faithful and help us to continue to um, show up and learn as much as we can. Uh, Father, we want, we want to just thank you for bringing us to the end of a, a week. And uh, as we're beginning a new week, be with us and help us to be prepared for the challenges that we're going to face. Uh, and we look forward again to your soon, your soon return. So thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and thank you for answering in Jesus' name. Amen.